All right, now we've got to just shift a little bit of tone and uh, country. Jason Levine, I'm going to bring him on in like 30 seconds, is independent journalist. I don't even know what the word is anymore. It's like commentator, truth seeker. And I guess truth seekers have become the modern day independent journalists. Um, and we're going to talk about what the hell's going on in Canada. And I, did I say it like a boot? We're going to talk a boot. The Coots for people. You all know about it because I've talked about it a few times, but we're going to go into much greater detail now. Jason, you ready? Coming in three, two. Oh, I was ahead of schedule. Sir, how goes the battle? Good morning, Viva. The battle is the battle, absolutely. And it's going good, actually. I got some good news and I can bring some hope to you today. And I All actually right. just want to comment on Dr. Shiva there. The independent voices, I absolutely would relate to that. He's He is right. We yeah. absolutely need a lot more independent voices, for sure. I, I, people can, uh, what I love is he's not, uh, he's not shy. He presents himself. If you don't like it, you won't like it. But at least you won't like what you know, as opposed to not liking what you don't know because you don't actually know what he said. Before we even get into the story here, Tell the world who you are, because I discovered you relatively recently, I think. Um, so I suspect other people might not know of you. Who are you? Well, my name is Jason Levine. I am Alberta. I run a podcast. I'm running for independent as an independent candidate for the next federal election here. And I'm just a truth seeker. So my entire uh, thing here is I, I didn't like what I saw with the convoy and then the subsequent POEC. Um, so I st stood up and, and created a show and I wanted to get the message out because Canada and our media is absolutely not touching any of the important issues here because we oh, have the, quite the a narrative machine here. Oh yeah, no. The, the coots has been the coots for in particular has been um, muted. Uh, now I won't get into your childhood because we don't have enough time today. No but problem. Just, uh, may I ask how old you are? Uh, Forty-five. Forty-five. May I ask what you did or do in life before having gotten into independent journalism, like tr education and profession? Absolutely. So I'm a nerd. So I do technology. Uh, my first career was technology. So I, I did all the ones and zeros and, and write code. And I did that to about uh, 38. And then I went back to school. So I went to law school to go ahead and acquire a paralegal license because I wanted to have a lot more understanding of the law and be able to work with it correctly. And uh, I graduated and I got my license and I wrote the test on my 40th birthday. So uh, February 14th, uh, 2017, I wrote my exam, passed it, and I became a legal a professional on my 40th birthday and then I mean, since then I, I got into more things well i mean that, i see that's the biggest congratulations and, and achievement is at a later age i mean mm. I, I what was the average age of, of the people you were studying with uh half my were, age for sure yeah, yeah half my age in, intimidating uh and humbling is i guess one word and also on the other hand may, maybe empowering and that you know a, sh a lot more than they do and they don't even know what they don't know yet and where, where are you located? But just not address, but like province city wise. Sure. I'm west of Edmonton uh, near a town called Breton in between Drayton Valley and Breton. We made the news not too long ago with our wildfires here. It was pretty, pretty harsh out here. West of Edmonton. Let me just go west ahead and grab Edmonton. a map. Okay. Jokes aside, I'll, I'll look at that afterwards. Never eat shredded wheat. So you're closer to the West yeah. Coast. <laughs> I'm such towards an Towards Jasper, towards the mountains uh, okay. is where I am. I'm between the mountains and the city in a perfect okay, place to be brought, by the way. Yes. Amazing. So now let's let's I mean let's get into the story. The story. The I think everybody knows about the Coots Four, but you certainly know more of the details. I've talked about it and read some of the articles uh, live and 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 explained it. Talked about it with Jeremy McKenzie when he was on, but even he he was not directly involved no. tangentially. But tell us about the Coots Four, the role that this this incident played in the invocation of the Emergencies Act, and what the hell is going on with these four individuals, these four accused, who still, as far as I understand, remain behind bars if not all four, two of the four, almost two all years later, all of them. So yes. give us give yes. us the lowdown here. Well, if we want to start the POEC, so I know you were covering it, I was covering it, war campaign POEC. was covering it. Ex uh, the that Public is Order the Emergency oh. Commission. Yep, okay. Yeah, and this was the inquiry that's required by law once the Emergency Act is invoked, and it has to happen within the first year. And yeah, we covered it, you covered it, and I believe war campaign covered it, but that was it. For all of Canada, it was me, you, and one other person covering the POEC. And we followed it all the way to the end to the report. And I'm sure you remember there, Viva, that basically the entire POEC pointed to the Coots guns as the real catalyst to create a nationwide emergency for Canada because they tied it to a nationwide organization, which Jeremy McKenzie is very familiar with. And I know you understand is nothing more than a comedy group of in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how they tie that all together. Now, and during the POEC. Just, just to stop you there so that people don't accuse me of straw manning. Sure. The Diagonal thing started off as a meme. Even CTV News wrote an article, meme, or did it? Did people take it seriously? 
Uh, so it, it started off as a meme joke. Everybody understood that. Even the news understood that. But then you yeah. have your hacks that try to turn a joke into reality and think that by their reporting, they somehow legitimize that absurdity. Sorry, go on. Absolutely. And, it, and with the vice president being a cocaine ad addicted goat. Um, yeah, this is a comedy group. Uh, Philip is he's rough to work with because I had to get an interview with Jeremy and I had to work with <laughs> Philip. <laughs> but at the end of this, what I learned was not only is Jeremy an excellent human being, he's also another political prisoner and he's still going through things right now as we speak. So Jeremy McKenzie uh, was just in court just yesterday dealing with this still. So this is a quite the house of cards that was built up in the POEC, the Public Order Emergency Commission. And then the final report report that we got from Rouleau really highlighted and pointed to the stuff that we didn't get to see during the POEC, which was all the in-camera stuff. Now, in-camera means in private. We don't get to see it. And a majority of that was the national security concerns that were caused by the Coots for. So the way I look at this, Viva, is it's an inverted pyramid of a house of cards. They didn't build a normal house of cards. It's an inverted one. And at the bottom is the POE, is the uh, Coots 4 and the allegations against them. So this is why I think it's incredibly important to pay a lot of attention to what's going on here and what can come out of this. Because if those house of cards fall down, it's Brenda Lucky, the RCMP commissioner, and Trudeau and his entire cabinet that's sitting at the top of that. And the entire POEC could or should uh, fall if this is the case, if this was a false allegation and false imprisonment. Well, that, that won't happen. Um, and they'll never be able to, <laughs> it, it won't happen. And also there's enough uh, dirt already thrown out there that people will never believe it was absolutely fabricated. Be, be, I'll just, just, I'm trying to pull up an article from the time, February 24, sure. 2022. Coots arrests new details on the men and women charged in the border blockade. Cause there were two blockades at the time there was, or blockades. There were pr multiple fronts of the protest. Uh, there was one, the Windsor blockade in Ontario. And then there yeah. was, I think it was called the Coots blockade in Alberta. And allegedly, uh, four individuals were arrested on charges of conspiring to murder an RCMP officer. The, the smoking gun evidence, oh, it's right there. The smoking gun evidence that they have, Lord knows what's in here because it's just, you know, it's, it's laid out like the FBI laid out Trump's classified documents. Right. The smoking gun, if I can zoom in right here to tie this yeah. into Diagon, were these patches right here. Uh, whether or not any of these firearms were actually unlawful, illegal in Canada, because Canada has very strict long arm rifles. You can't um, have magazines that carry more than five rounds. Um, this is very strict. Whether or not any of these weapons were even illegal, other than looking scary in a picture thrown in with some charges to conspire to murder an RCMP officer, this was one of the pretexts for how dangerous the protest had become. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. For sure. And boy, did they ever point to that picture a lot. And actually, if you pull up for a quick second, I'll just give you a quick little piece of information on that. There's 15 guns there. The only one that is prohibited is the one we call gun number eight. It's on the right hand side. It's got the camouflage and it's got the nice scope on it. That's the only gun there that's prohibited. The rest are OK. The handguns also have restrictions on them. So the handguns and the one large gun on the right hand side with the camouflage, those are the well, only well, ones that would be considered to be a, a problem. Well, uh, sorry, uh, the, which one did you say the long arm? That one right one there. Yeah, you're zooming in right there. Yeah. Th this so, one with the arrow with the cursor on it? So just to the left of that one. This one. That's the one. Yeah, we call that gun number eight because it's the eighth one there. That one is a prohibited weapon. The rest uh, pro are prohibited are, are, outright or prohibit or uh, authorized with a special permit because the, the small no, ones can have their. Okay, so correct. Outright. So, yeah, so the handguns you can get it. It's called a um, restricted yeah, a pal. pass or restricted okay. license. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so but the, the other one you can't. Uh, that's what I just want to highlight because the difference is that the small arms are not illegal; they're restricted. You can you can correct. lawfully own them with a license if you say, and I don't know any better, that number eight is just outright illegal in Canada because of whatever capacity. Uh, then I'll take your word for that as well. But I I couldn't independently verify. Uh, but the, just so sure. everybody understands, distinction between restricted which means you can still own it with a license your pal license small arms and illegal as in not allowed even with a license gun number eight apparently correct okay. correct so gun number eight and i just want to highlight yes it's very difficult or illegal for a citizen to own that gun but we have found pictures of that gun in rcmp videos okay so rcmp do own guns like that not saying it's right. that one we don't know that but we're just saying they do have access to and that's, it. that's not to say that the, the evidence could have been you know uh not falsified mistakes happen you know like some, absolutely some, oh, accidents, oh, happen. accidents happen okay sure so the, well, if we want to be men, accurate yeah the four men at the time what do you know what the details that led to them being arrested were they at the yes, protest from what i understood the guns were seized not on site at the protest whatsoever 
Correct. So I'll take you through minute by minute of their arrest okay, because it's please. a very important point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so what we had was the RCMP officer, Ro Roberto McHale, come out and give us an uh, indication of what they were doing. And what she told everybody was this was a separate group from Coots protesters and they captured them and they were violent offenders and they were going to kill uh, officers. However, the actual truth is at 9 p.m. February 13th, uh, Chris Lysick, while he was walking around doing a live stream at the protest itself at the Coots border, he was arrested after he made what they called uttering threats. He wasn't arrested for conspiracy for anything. He was arrested at that time for uttering threats. And what he said was he was jealous of the police officer's weapon. So they arrested him at 9 p.m. At 9.50 p.m., also at the Coots border, uh, Anthony or yeah, Anthony Tony uh, Olenek was picked up for one mischief. Of the four. He's one of the four. Yep. Okay. Correct. So at this time at 9 p.m., we have one of the four picked up for uttering threats. Uh, we have Tony picked up for mischief 50 minutes later. And then the next morning, very early at 12.30 a.m., uh, Christopher Carbett was picked up in the Coots trailer. This is an important place because this is where the cache of guns was uh, allegedly found. Uh, he was sleeping, by the way. And at this moment in time, Bevan, I think this is important to know. Uh, he knew that Chris Lysick and Anthony were arrested. They all knew that they were being arrested, not being arrested, but that they were arrested. And how did he respond? Did he run away with the guns? Did he go and try and get everybody? No, he fell asleep uh, because, of course, he's, we believe he's an innocent man. Uh, and then the next afternoon on his way to work, nowhere near Coots, by the way, three hours away um, west of Calgary, he was picked up on Highway 22 at 12 p.m., again, charged with mischief. So Chris Carbett in the trailer was charged with mischief as well. At this time, there was no conspiracy to commit murder charges that came onto them. So I want to highlight that because the very next day, like basically at the same time, literally the same time that Jerry's being arrested at 12 p.m. Uh, mountain time is when the RCMP are out there giving the press conference telling us at that time that they're picking up people for charges of conspiracy to commit murder. However, the records show, and we were able to find this out, that uh, Jerry, at the time this uh, RCMP officer is giving us the information, that's the first person charged with conspiracy to commit murder. So at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, Jerry was charged. I also want to highlight some weird stuff here on the February 14th to you, Viva, because we have an article from the CBC at the time of 5.54 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, so very early, February 14th. They're reporting that the EA is going to be invoked. So before the charges and even before some of the arrests, they were already telling us that the EA was coming out. And then the prime minister himself at 1.41 p.m. Mountain Standard Time announced to all of us, the entire world, he's invoked the EA. However, at 4.58 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, that's when the other three men were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. So at the time of the invocation uh, of the EA, they weren't even fully charged. Now, let me... Uh... It's not that I trust, but verify for everybody else out there. Where mm -hmm. can people see your, we're not going to go through your homework now. Where can we see, where can the people test, verify, and maybe even correct your homework in terms of timeline, details, facts like this? Well, we do put it out on our podcast every morning. So we do at least an hour where we talk about this. We've done 20 episodes now. So it's a lot of information sprinkled in there. And we do have access to the disclosure from all sides. So the, the defense and the, uh, the crown. So we have that disclosure. And we went through all of that to confirm our times this morning. Happy to right. share that information with anybody that wants to reach out. Well, yeah, and, and you'll give me your links and I'll put them in there so people can find them afterwards. So the individuals Absolutely. are are arrested uh, by two days after, so by February, what was the fourth arrest? February 16, 2022? No, so we were all arrested the 13th and 14th. So by noon on the 14th was Jerry on his way to work. He was the last okay. one picked up. Noon on the 14th, and they're arrested, all but one of them are arrested on mischief-ish charges? One of them Correct. was arrested on... Okay. So Chris Lysick was arrested at 9 p.m. for his comment to a police officer about how nice his gun was and how he wished he had one. So that that's on video. So Chris was streaming when that happened. Um, so we know exactly how this went down and at what time. And also Tony was streaming just before he got arrested, like minutes before. So again, we know where he was and at what time. Um, so and, yeah, and he was. My follow-up question is: These four individuals have been in jail since that date. 
523 days straight. And I want to highlight something that maybe people don't understand. They're not in prison. They're in a place called remand. And in Canada, remand is such a terrible place to be that we give you two to one on your time there, time served. So when you do some time there, let's say you did 100 days, it'll count as 200 days because it's a horrible place to be. There's no gym. You can't see your wife. There's no conjugal visits. In fact, prisons is upgrade when it comes to the remand center. So they've spent 523 days in the worst place to possibly be when it comes to the justice system here in Alberta. And I'm just I'm just Googling one article right now, which says I'm not going to bring it up. Uh, I don't want to, it says remand. Oh, this is a uh, looks like a, 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 a not a charity, but a, a, a John Howard Society of BC fact sheet. Someone in remand is either placed in pretrial center or in the provincial correctional facility. Those in remand custody prior to trial, there's concern about deprivation of freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. Most especially if there is the possibility of infringement of these rights. These individuals are oh, very serious, very scary charges. Uh, consp conspiracy to commit murder. Everybody has to fully appreciate, even according to legal scholars in Canada, there were examples of someone who attempted to commit murder on a police officer, still got bail. The um, 100%. In Toronto, we have a police, an, an accused police officer killer out with a GPS tracker. Yep. And uh, the man who ran over four protesters Winnipeg. in Winnipeg released on bail. It was a big bail. I think it was 750000 but I don't know how much they have to put up on that. Released on bail. Attempted, actual attempted murder released on bail. These four individuals, accusations of conspiracy to commit murder, no act of violence or right. anything that I know of, still in jail nearly two years later. All right. Um, Absolutely. And, and what we can talk about here is about how the media has been treating this. It's very weird because not only has our mainstream media not been covering this, but even our alt media hasn't been covering this. And I can actually talk a bit about this media ban that everybody has been talking about, if you like. Go, go, go ahead. Talk about the, the media ban because, look, I, first of all, I, some of these cases have gag orders on them. I'm not sure about this sure, one. Sure, it happens. Uh, but, but also, we're not we're not talking any specific detail that would even be covered by a gag order. And then I'll entertain the ideas as to why you think alternative media might not be talking about it. But but uh, for sure, the the, the floor is yours, sir. Sure. So we have a thing called an information to obtain. This is used to file for a warrant. These are documents that are created by the police officers or Crown or whoever is trying to attempt to get a warrant. They're called an information to obtain. There was 10 of them uh, created for this particular matter. Four of them are completely banned from publication because of the content of it. The court did not want the content of that out. The other six has sections that are redacted. Those are under the publication ban. Viva, that's it. Everything else was allowed. The entire court conversations, the witness statements, everything else was allowed to be publicized, just not the contents of four ITOs and then sections of six other ones. That's what the media then said is a media ban. And that's what they used to go ahead and be silent about this. But I want to highlight something to Viva. Nothing's changed in court at all in the last uh, year about the publication ban on these items. Nothing's changed. Yet Rebel, True North, and others are now talking. So I believe they understand the media ban a little bit better now that it isn't one. And now they're starting to talk, which is good news for the men. But me uh, there was no media ban. Okay. And now is the, uh, is the theory a sinister one or rather one of ignorance and reliance? Uh, and I, and I, and I, I, I would, I, I would put one to the sinister category. The other two probably just following along. Uh, Rebel had a uh, truckerlawyer.ca website, which told everybody they'd be supporting the legal fees for anybody associated with this. None of these men have received any legal assistance. Uh, and, and full disclosure, I happen to like Rebel, and it's not to say that yeah. nobody, nobody's, no. nobody's infallible, nobody's perfect, but, and there's no but. So, uh, you know, you're telling me this, the question is this, uh, who are their lawyers and how are they raising legal funds or assuming their legal fees? Well, I got a couple of the names of the lawyers, but what you should know is they only have one original lawyer. So Tony uh, has his original lawyer that was there all along, and she's wonderful, and she's doing a great job, and we'll get into a little detail what she found in a second here. Um, and then two of the men have legal aid lawyers, and they've been swapping lawyers throughout the entire thing, the other three. They've been firing Le some. Legal aid lawyers. Yeah, and, and two of them have legal aid. That's no judgment. That's just to say they apply for, and it has to be a, the legal aid lawyer has to agree to take up the file. Right. Now, th the way it's kind of laid out is is Tony's lawyer is basically leading the whole charge because they're all mm -hmm. tried together here on this one. And by the way, they, they still don't have trial date. We're in pretrial motion still. We, we're looking at maybe May and June for a trial date on these gentlemen.
And I'm, I'm, that, yeah, will, that, will, that will take us close to August 2024, which will be um, a 30 month uh, limit. And then they might be set free. And I also want to highlight the men don't want that to happen. The men want their day in court because they want to clear their name. They don't want to be released on a technicality. Well, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate that sentiment. I would not want to, I would not trust the system for these uh, people to get a fair trial. Um, but just the, I forget what the name is in Canada, but there's a chart of violation. If you don't have a speedy trial, your charges are stayed. It just occurred for a pedophile, an accused pedophile right. in Nova right. Scotia, uh, but not for these two men who are still sitting in pretrial detention and have yet to have their trial. It's, it's, it's an obscenity. It's an obscenity. Even if they had committed an actual uh, murder, they should have had their trial. Oh, let me rephrase. If they were accused of having committed an actual murder, they should have had their trial by now uh, and not be held up in, in, in court indefinitely um, yeah and to, to highlight on that one viva yeah to highlight on that one we had the poec in the meantime so the government was able to get their information <laughs> together for this incident bring it forward to the committee and make judgments on it and come to a conclusion so they had enough time to prepare their de defense of what they're doing here so why not go ahead with the trial just as speedy uh there's a question mark around that well especially i mean i don't even know what what new evidence have they um adduced or or i should say how have they been dragging their feet in terms of providing the evidence uh, to the to the accused? It's a uh, it's full disclosure, correct? I mean, uh, I, I've never correct in law, but it's they have to turn over everything to the accused. Uh, well, in, you know, well. So go on there. From what I understand, there there may be some issues about exculpatory evidence having been turned over to the defendants. Right. So there was a really interesting thing. So just to let everybody know in Canada, ideally, the Crown will give you all, all the uh, disclosure, but not always. Sometimes you have to do an application for disclosure when you're aware of something or you need some more information or there seems to be something missing. So as a defendant, you have to really be on top of your game to make sure that you're getting all the information out of them. We saw Jeremy McKenzie do this yesterday, an application for disclosure. Uh, but the gentlemen have done that. Now, let me tell you what happened. This is really cool. Um, so they received disclosure last minute, last second, just like we saw in the POEC, thousands of documents were dumped on them. So the defense, Tony, asked for uh, an adjournment to go over those, and she got it. Now, what happened was uh, something was found, uh, what we were told, and again, we can report this, there is no media ban. Um, there was disclosure provided that was unredacted. It was originally, I guess, intended to be redacted, but it was not redacted. So the defense got a piece of disclosure that was incredibly exciting to them. So what they did is they put together an argument, filed an application, a CC1, which is an application to the criminal court to have something done. And we don't know the contents and exactly what was found, but Viva, the chief, the crown chief, deputy chief prosecutor at the Alberta Prosecution Services, his name is Steve Johnson. He's been prosecuting this entire matter. He was not in court on June 29th. He was not welcomed and not allowed to be. Let me explain to you why. The defense found something that has them referring to him as a witness in this matter now. Now, Viva, you know, witnesses cannot sit in trial. They have to be outside. They can't be sitting there for the due influence that may happen. So the deputy chief prosecutor for this matter and his psychic, his assistant, were not in court on June 29th. There was a third person there from the Crown's office who was very confused about what was going on. What ended up happening was... Go ahead. This it, it actually sounds a little bit like what we saw in the Zachariah Anderson trial, where you might have had a prosecutor who I have no knowledge of what happened in the Coots case. In Zachariah right. Anderson's case, you had the prosecutor meeting with witnesses uh, without disclosing it, potentially for the purposes of allegedly uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, change or uh, influencing that that testimony, and thus exclude themselves as a prosecutor for certain portions because they've made themselves witnesses or. Another thing that I know in a separate case, don't know if it has anything to do with this one, what Jeremy McKenzie discovered, the text messages between RCMP officers for the protest, let's bring in the horse and if the horse gets killed or, you know, something along those right. lines. So could be, it, hypothetically, I have no knowledge. These are two things that I know from experience. So, sorry, please carry That's on. That's incredible that you brought up the Jeremy McKenzie one because I have a second source of that one. Uh, Bridget Belton said the same thing. Uh, she received the text earlier before it happened. We can get into that another day, Biva. Uh, oh, yeah, no, well, but, Jer Jeremy talked about that. That's why he's public enemy number one for the RCMP. He humiliated them by releasing those texts that he somehow got. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, now to finish up what's going on here. So the RCMP then was very curious on what's in this sealed envelope. Uh, so they've been told to go get counsel so if they can get access to that uh, sealed envelope. And the uh, Alberta Law Society is now involved as well. And you know they get involved when there's misconduct with lawyers. So we now have the Crown who's not no longer there because he's been referred to as a witness and a possible defendant. I forgot that part. So that came out in court uh, that he may be a possible defendant in this matter. And this is the Crown, the, the deputy chief. Um, and then we also had the Law Society, and then we have the the RCMP being told to lawyer up. So the good news is on uh, Tuesday, July 25th, just next week, uh, we'll be back there in court, and we're going to see what happens from this, because we should be getting some sort of result from uh, the, this um, uh, CC1. Criminal court hearings are, are public by rule, unless it's, you know, related to this stuff. A lot of the stuff has been done in camera or, uh, you know, behind closed doors. Yeah, none of this has, by the way. That's why there was no media ban. There's none of this. Uh, it's are you publicly uh, open. You're going to go in person to the courthouse. Absolutely, I'll be there the whole week. I right, did. I think we're, we're going to, we'll be talking next. Well, it is. Uh, it's next week. It's July 25th. It is. Yeah, yeah. So the 25th okay. on Tuesday, I'll be in Lethbridge, and I'll be streaming in the mornings. And I'm happy to come on and give you updates right. if you like a thousand, that. Just don't stream in the courthouse. Don't take pictures in the courthouse. You can get no. A we are. Time. <laughs> well, actually, we're, we're seeking permission because in Canada, if you get permission, you can record. Um, so we're hoping that we can record at least the audio. But we're working with the court on that. We won't be doing okay, anything that causes problems. Uh, fascinating stuff. All right. Um, where were we in terms of timeline? And uh, I think we're... Well, 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 let me well, now well, talk about... Going. Sure. Let me talk about how we're getting this information out because this mainstream media wasn't assisting us at all. Um, so what we did is we reached out to a whole bunch of people that we knew and eventually we got a hold of, uh, well, he actually got sent to us, uh, Gord McGill. From, he writes for Newsweek. Yep. So he came in and interviewed us and I have an entire episode where he's sitting there interviewing us. So you guys can watch this. We're very transparent here on this show. And from that article, we've now gotten a lot of attention. Fox News has reached out to us. Uh, Rebel is now writing about it. Uh, True North is now writing about it. So I'm very excited that now the word is starting to get out and more and more people are understanding a whole bunch of things. One, there's no media ban. We can talk about this and we really should be talking about this. And two, the entire POEC hinges on what happened here in Coots. So let's get to trial. Let's actually start seeing some of this evidence because we do have a disclosure. I'm telling you, I don't see it. I well, don't see and, and I will, after this stream, I'm going to go flip back to that portion of the POEC where Justice Rouleau talks about the Coots mm -hmm. as the the catalyst. I mean, literally the catalyst right. like this. It was, it, that was the basis for the violence, the fear of violence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and right. that's and not we, to say, we, it's not to say that these charges are totally trumped up and, and manufactured, but crazier things have happened and you'd have to be very naive to not think that that's a possibility. Absolutely, because if this is all really just perfectly fine, there's nothing wrong here, it still doesn't tell us why there's no bail. Why can't we put GPS on these guys? Why can't we take away their passport? We do this, like you said, for the guy in Winnipeg. The he only, his, only, yeah, his only conditions was stay away from Winnipeg. You're not allowed to welcome back in Winnipeg. And, 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 and a large a large bail, I think. I'll large cash. Yeah, that. and we do 10% here in Canada. And then I believe he had a GPS tracker. But that was it. Like, he had conditions and he's allowed to be free until trial. Because in Canada, we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. These gentlemen are not receiving that treatment right now. And and tell us about the treatment they are receiving in jail, because I understand it's it's inhumane. Viva, this is bothering me a lot because we just read a bunch of messages from each man. Uh, we have friends and family on every Friday, so we got a message from each man and read it out. Whew. Tony explained to us how happy he was because he saw a magpie through a window. And Chris told us how happy he was because he got to spend some time with a grasshopper. And we also got one from Jerry who said, I got a beam of sun in for about a half an hour and I got to watch it move across the wall. These men are in solitary confinement for 22 hours a day. They're not in general population. They don't get good food. They don't get medication. One of our gentlemen needs um, uh, medication, but not medication. He needs supplements. And because the Alberta Health Services in Alberta does not see those as medication, it's not available to the men. They can't get anything that can't come through Alberta Health Services. So simple supplements for his knees, he can't get. And just yesterday, I'm happy to report that Chris Lysick, after a year and a half, got contact lenses. He can now see again. Can I ask the naive question? Why are they not in Gen Pop? Why are they in solitary? Because they're worried about them talking. 
they're keeping them separate. So two of them are in Lethbridge and I believe two, one goes to Medicine Hat and one goes to Calgary. The two in Lethbridge can't be on the same floor. And if they do, for whatever reason, for crowding, have to put them on the same floor, there's guards on them specifically. They don't get to have the ability to speak. And I also want to highlight one of them's married. And well, I was get just ask that. No, uh, four men are one, only one married. Do any of them have children? Not that that makes There's seven children. There's seven children. There's two birthdays, two Father's Days so far that went by for all of them. There's seven children here. It, it, it is, it's unforgivable. Um, and, and even if convicted, it would be unforgivable because I, I say that just worst case scenario, they've stood justice. And even in prison, I presume that they would have, I mean, especially from what you're explaining, they'd have more rights than they currently have. Correct. It's it's prison would be an upgrade for them. Correct. You would get conjugal. There's a gym. You have a routine. You have your own cell. You have some stability. And you also know when you're getting out. They're in purgatory really right now because they have no idea what's going to happen. Not a clue. They're just sitting there waiting. This is the worst way to hold somebody. Absolutely. For sure. It's supposed to be a temper. Let me tell you also about what the prisoners say or the people that come in. There's some hardened criminals that have come left and then came back. And then they say, what? You guys are still here. Just call a lawyer. You'll be out. So it's very surprising to hear these kind of stories coming from even hardened criminals. They're surprised because you're supposed to be in trial or in prison. You're not supposed to stay in remand indefinitely. Um, okay, keep going. I mean, so yeah. what, what, what yeah, let me, the, the, yeah, let me tell it. you the, the, the angels that have showed up for this. So there's a, there's a young lady, we call her granny, but it's Margaret Mackay, who's been following this from almost the very beginning. And because of her, she's been keeping on top of this, talking to the men every day, talking to families every day. She's become a liaison for the family. She's on our show every day for 20 days. Now she's been telling us everything she knows. I also want to highlight Danielle. She is an amazing young young lady. She's a friend of Tony. So from the very beginning, she's been recording and going to court and taking notes. She's got all the news articles. She's got everything. And she's also been correcting the media. So when the media does say anything, she goes out and does stuff like that. And we also have Donald Best, who's a 15 year Toronto police officer who he himself was set up, put into prison for 63 days, solitary confinement. They had to put him there to keep him alive because he's a copper. And once he was vindicated, it was proven that some lawyers and a judge got corrupted uh, he got vindicated and now he's sitting here telling us about uh, his experience and he became a corruptions investigator so every morning myself donald best granny mckay and danielle we sit and talk about this we talk about the guns we bring in a gun expert we talk about the men we bring in the family and the entire time we're highlighting this entire story and all the different pieces of it i think it's worthwhile for some people to go check it out because if you want to know about the guns we have a gun expert that came in and talked about it this is how uh, we know when you say about the guns, you mean the legality of the lawful ownership or possession of the guns? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we look at the models. We've checked it, cross-referenced it, and find out if they're registered requirement, if they're restricted, or if they're prohibited. We went through all of that to make sure we understand. And so that's, Eva, that's the, interesting because from, from a factual perspective, from your analysis, and people can take it for what it's worth, all of the guns were either unrestricted or potentially lawfully uh, ownable, except gun number eight in Canada. Gun number eight, and then the handguns had restrictions. Yeah, well, the, that's the, that's the, restrictions means yeah. you can still lawfully own them. Do we know if these guys correct. had their PAL licenses? They did. So there's no there's no problems with PALs. And by the way, these were hunting weapons. So Chris Lysick was going to shoot foxes and coyotes with his. These were not, but the media says it is. Um, the the small arms. I mean, the handguns you don't use for hunting, or I mean, I don't I don't know what what use. No, fair enough. Hunting. Fair enough. And through our but research, they have their we, they have their permit. Like the PAL is a personal acquisition license, I think, or something. Private. They have their license. You can apply for it. I've, I've been saying for a while, like owning a gun in Canada is a liability, even if you go through the rigor or whatever that word is of getting the mm -hmm. license. But they had their PAL licenses. So even if those are restricted small arms, they can be lawfully owned. And by all accounts, right. they, they, it seems like they were. But for this conspiracy to commit murder, what, what is the extent of the conspiracy to commit murder to flesh it out for anybody who doesn't know? Sure. And that's a great question because disclosure hasn't provided that to us, uh, Viva. So what we know is there was two undercover agents who claim without recordings and it wasn't tapped. They didn't have recordings on them. These uh, two officers that claim to have been undercover agents that got the information. According to them, there was conversation. But again, there's no recording. And all we have is stuff that we can't talk about much more because they are part of those the publication ban. But what I can tell you is there's no there's no wiretap. There's no recording of the conversation. Well, I, I, so we really don't know. No, no text message from 
from one to the other saying, let's meet up at, at five o'clock to do this. No, but I can tell you that the uh, affidavit from these two police officers, they contradict each other quite a bit and they don't uh, provide anything that substantiates uh, uh, conspiracy to commit murder, at least in my so the, assessment the, the, of it. The bottom line, and from your understanding, the evidence to even support the allegations is what two undercover agents said. There's no written exhibit. There's no uh, audio recording tap that would substantiate this. It's uh, they said and four people have been in jail for 500 and some odd days now. Correct. And, and from what we found in the POEC, they said on February 12th, which is two days before the arrest, February 12th is when they started to get intel about these gentlemen. So from February 12th to February 14th, we don't see the intel they didn't provide in disclosure. There isn't much there at all. And now I'll, I'll ask the question, not that past is necessarily prologue. Do any of these men have any prior convictions, violent or otherwise? Great question. Three of them have a completely clean, clean record. One of them has a juvenile record that was a uh, conditional release. So he didn't actually get convicted. C clean enough, in other words. Not that it yeah, means that someone enough. who's got a clean record is not going to go out and commit conspiracy to commit murder against an RCMP officer. But if I had to bet, I know where I'd be hedging my bets. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and fully functional contributing members of society. What did they do, uh, for work before getting locked up for two years? Nearly. Well, Jerry was a line man. So he goes up on the wires and he does all that stuff. Uh, Chris Carbert was a landscaper. He had his own business, very successful award winning, by the way, he won lots of awards with his business. Um, Chris Lysick, I'm quite, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to have to check my notes on that, but he was just an average guy. And then Tony, he was an <clears throat> excavator operator and then basically a heavy equipment operator. So these yeah, are just regular Albertans. Okay, you got you got uh, at least on my end the audio got garbled there. What, what was the the, the the fourth person? Uh, the fourth person is Chris Car oh, No, not Chris. Uh, Tony. So Tony. Um, sorry, I kind of lost myself there. So Tony oh, no, was just, a lineman. Uh, okay, go go through the four one more time, just everybody. Okay, yeah. So Jerry's a lineman. Chris Carbert Carbert was a landscaper. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Lysick, I'm not quite sure. And then Tony was an excavator operator, heavy equipment okay. operator. Perfect. Um, so regular Albertans, regular Canadians. In fact, I want to tell you about their message. Um, two of them found faith in there, so they do Bible studies. So uh, Tony, he runs a yoga class of all things to keep people together when he has his two hours out of solitary confinement. Keep in mind, 22 hours solitary, two hours out. Um, and then Chris Carbert as well. He's opened up a Bible study and he's looking at maybe becoming a pastor and he's been working that uh, path as well. And when you hear messages from them, there's no hate or anger. In fact, in fact, uh, Kobe or Kobe, uh, Chris Carbert says he wants to help the people in the remand because it's horrible there. So this person who the government wants you to believe wanted to take down the government actually wants to improve the system that is against him at this moment. That's amazing. When I, when I had the the lectern guy on Adam Johnson, he says, you know, after his experience that he got out after 71 days, he says it's it's unfathomable, incomprehensible, unconscionable, even if these are hardened criminals, uh, many of whom are not, many of whom are suffering sentences that far exceed the gravity of the crime. The conditions are inhumane um, in yeah. the state. I presume it's it's no better in Canada. It might just be a smaller, a smaller population proportionate to the society. And let me tell you what a guard told Tony not too long ago, or no, sorry, it was Jerry, because Jerry has been put in the max pen punishment. He's with hardened criminals like gang banner bangers and stuff. He's in the max stuff. Um, a guard came up to him and said, listen, I thought you were a white supremacist. You, you don't, you don't seem to be one. And this was after getting to know Jerry over time. So they were informed that these are hardened white supremacists coming in that, that go after government. So the guards were prepared for that. The guards are turning and they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is not quite right. Um, okay, any, any more material facts that people have to know in order to appreciate the situation? I would say that um, the whole charging and how the RCMP officers and how the EA came out, the timeline doesn't work well. The EA was first talked about on February 12th. They first start talking about this group in February 12th. And if this group was so hardened and so horrible, why didn't they just go pick them all up as soon as they had enough? They didn't. They let them go to the Coots border crossing. Go. Two of them were down there. One fell asleep. Another guy went home, went to work the next day. These these gentlemen were not picked up together. And also the cache of guns that you see on the table, there's 15 of them. Only six of them are attributed to the men. The other nine, we don't even know who the owners of those are. I'm sorry. Let's just stop right there. How do you know that? Disclosure. <laughs> they were all picked up in the arrest records. Crap. Hold on. I took the picture away, but now I want to get back to that. So that is to say of that entire cache... 
what you're saying. 15 guns. Yeah. Yep. Six are attributed to the gentleman. Two that are not in the picture because Jerry was not picked up till the 14th and he had his two guns were in his truck with him. So Jerry has two guns that were in his truck. They're hunting guns. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Not in that cash picture at all. That's, um, that's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So six of the weapons were picked up with Chris. We got that from the arrest records. And then there were other weapons picked up in other locations and put on that table. Okay. And so ownership of those other weapons, we're not sure, but my goodness, ownership's unknown Chris after our research. And we're not even sure which ones are the men's because we don't want to, we don't know that, but we know how many weapons they were picked up with. So we know that six of them are attributed to the men that are on that table and uh, two that are not on that table. And I also want to highlight some false rumors. So there's a lot of people with false information showing that picture around saying it's an old one. That's not true. We, we strongly believe that picture is genuine. It is a picture of stuff on February 14th. Uh, so there's some false rumors out there that I'd like to kind of put to bed. All right. Now I've just got a text message from my wife saying, we got to go with an exclamation point because we're we need to be out of this place very soon. But no um, problem. I appreciate it. No, and, and, and by the way, first of all, I'm, I'm, my apologies for having... Uh, but well, actually, both interviews have gone longer than anticipated. But the, this is information that needs to get out. So the four we minutes. Will... Well, and now the, people can follow the details. The problem is, however, sometimes it just becomes too difficult to follow that people will tune out. The bottom line, I mean, I I, I went through McGill's article the day before mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, and it and it sums it up. There's there's an opinion in there, but there's also fact. These men have been charged with conspiracy to commit murder of an RCMP officer, which is a serious charge. That Correct. that photograph that they were blasting around the media at the time of the arrests to show how violent and dangerous this protest was, was bullshit at the time. And I and I called it bullshit at the time because I, I knew even at the time the picture, the weapons were seized uh, uh, far away from where the protest was occurring. That doesn't mean it's not related. That protest had nothing to do with the occupation of Ottawa. All of this was lumped together with, with the rumors, the fog of war at the time, to create mm -hmm. a fear for January 6th that never culminated. Uh, this was used as the pretext to declare the Emergencies Act for Justin Trudeau to declare because right. of the violence. Uh, Rouleau heavily relied on those arrests and that allegation to um, substantiate, legitimize uh, Trudeau's invocation of the act. I mean, that's basically the basis Correct. on which he, that's he the ratified only one. It. And uh, these men, guilty or not, have been sitting in torturous, inhumane conditions for damn near two years off charges mm -hmm. which... Any other non-political prisoner would have gotten bail under whatever sure. restriction. I mean, you imagine, first of all, the bail that Tamara Lich, uh, Chris Barber, Pat King got was, was or no, they didn't actually, uh, I forget what Pat King got once he finally got it five months later. The, the, the terms of release that Tamara Lich got were excessive for her charges, but at least she oh, got for sure. conceptual freedom. These guys, worse, uh, definitively worse criminals have gotten bail. Uh, and these guys are are nothing more and nothing less than political prisoners of Justin Trudeau because this inexplicable, incomprehensible, and absolutely legally unjustifiable that they have not been given bail pending the trial, period. Let me add one uh, piece here before before you please. leave. And I'm sorry to your wife. I'm, I'll say that first. Um, <laughs> the East Coast, I'm sure you're aware that we had a massacre over there. There's some guy that acted like an RCMP officer and, and created a lot of damage over there. This is the Nova Scotia shooting, which I've, I've talked about multiple yep. times jeremy mckenzie talked about it uh right at the beginning of covid a lot of questions about it because this individual was able to pull out 400 and some odd thousand dollars cash from a special bank account that he had driving around an rcmp cruiser which we're still not sure if it was fake or legitimate wearing a uniform <laughs> lots of questions sorry but let me tell you what happened with that one so brenda lucky is on a recording uh trying to contact the dispatchment over there and asked them and again this is on recording can you give me the details of the guns we need to politicize the guns okay the yep. response from her own rcmp officers at that time is absolutely not you should not be talking to us about that we'll have an open active investigation we do not want to give the information about the guns out because we do not want any accomplices possibly out to there to know anything about what we know look at now what they did here the exact same day they put guns on the table they're not going to go for fingerprints there's no dna testing this is not how you handle weapons you don't put it in the press and they were telling us the entire time this is a big conspiracy canada wide so there must be other accomplices why in the world are they treating alberta and showing the guns like that when the proper way to do it is bag everything you're gonna you're gonna print it you're gonna get dna you're gonna be searching for other people you're not gonna tell the public what you got but yet in Alberta, within an hour of making the announcement, this this photo's out. No, it, that's it, not, it, that's it not was, how they operate. 
It was a well, it was a PR campaign, and I guess Trudeau learned his lessons from the military as to how to use propaganda during a time of crisis. I mean, it, it was a it was a media campaign run by Justin Trudeau's CBC, CTV, Global Correct. News subsidized media. Simple as that. The, that doesn't change whether or not they're guilty. It certainly changes the Correct. modus operandi. So um, that politicized yeah. it in our world. That's politicized it. If you're doing uh, that, po it's politicized, not weaponized, and compromised. Right. I mean, you're compromising any investigation that you have if it's legitimate. And then keeping Absolutely. them in jail—it's—it's—it's it's, it's, uh, it's unconscionable. Um, the the Nova so Scotia, one, yeah. Sorry. Go yeah, ahead. happy to, to update you each day that we do this. I'll come back as often as you like. Yeah. So I understand if you have to run, but happy to let people know about our show every morning, six a.m. Please Mountain time. let them know. And after this is over, you'll send me your links, and I'll put them all in the the pinned comment, both on YouTube and when I pop put stuff there and Rumble. But please tell everybody who you are and where they can find you and how they can support you. Absolutely. So you can find me as Jason Living MP everywhere. So that is for Member of Parliament. I, I saw you ask that. But yes, I am running for a Member of Parliament. And I'm on Rumble, YouTube. I'm on all the major platforms. More importantly, make sure you go check out the Facebook group page, um, Alberta Political Prisoners. This is run by Granny Mackay. That's got the best information about everything on it. And you can also check out her website. And I believe that's Granny Mackay, so M-A-C-K-A-Y dot C-A. And from there, you can find out how you can support the men, get more involved, write letters, that kind of stuff. And it's a good way to kind of connect with the men. All right. Yeah. At least for now in the chat, I'm going to give everybody your Twitter feed and they can go find the other links from there. Uh, just to let everybody know, I screen grabbed all of the chats because I'm going to have no time now to go through them. I'm going to go through them later, either on a separate stream or on a Locals exclusive and um, I'll get to all of them in vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Jason, you know, I, I think we, we've covered the material facts in a concise enough uh, period of time that people can know to be outraged because guilty right. or not, you should be outraged. And I'm going to go ahead on a limb and predict that these men were absolutely set up in bogus, if not outright bogus, at the very least, absolutely exaggerated charges, um, politically motivated and politically exercised. That's my prediction. That's my opinion. And we'll see what happens. Um, I have no counter arguments for anything you just said there. No, we, we just saw how, we saw how it played out with all of the other nonviolent uh, uh, accused who were detained for excessive periods of time. It's yeah. um, it's 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 authoritarian level stuff. It's it's Putin level stuff. Ironically enough, from uh, a government that sits there criticizing Putin all the time for, you know, uh, excessive jail, uh, being harsh on journalists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Jason, keep up the good work. You, you st stay. We'll say our proper goodbyes in a second. Everyone in the chat. Sure. Uh, this has been uh, this has been uh, a very interesting morning, <laughs> and it's almost not morning no. anymore. Um, everyone well, in the chat. Merci beaucoup. Oh, merci yeah, beaucoup, and God bless you. Merci. Thank you very much. Stay here. We'll we'll say a few words afterwards. Everyone out there, go enjoy the day, and thank you all for being here. Peace.